Dr. Gazelle, thank you very much the panelist. You have made an inside contribution. However, the issues for moderators, constructive criticism is relative weight. We really define what constructive criticism. Sometimes when you convey the message and affect the, the, the moderator, then you come up with issues of constructive. Yeah. So we have to be very extra careful with that. The most important aspect is the comment from the youth leader, NYSE. Of course, I agree with you, we haven't yet political chaos. But we have social chaos, economic chaos. Yes. Now, if you two, two chaos, this side versus one chaos, how do you balance those? Because social chaos in the sense that there is 600 plus citizens, among them young people, who committed suicide in 10 months. How do you call that? And are the interventions? The second aspect that I like when you say that this, uh, the presentation by Dr. Gacera is not backed by any statistics, and I thought you were going to take yours with me. Yeah. I wanted to, to, to understand. You make an example to yourself that you grow this one, there was youth, but uh, I wanted to put a scale. Those that went through that system versus those who didn't go through that system that are suffering, yeah. how is the scale? Then we can debate about it. So it's very important that for the political parties, the political parties that brought change in the world, it is Labour Party in Brazil. And when you take manifest of the Labour Party, it's very clear with what they want. None of the political parties in Namibia, where you can say that if I read the manifesto, this is the uh, political ideology, is the economic ideology, the social ideology. There's no ideology. We have a bankruptcy of ideological principles in this country. How do we deal with that as young people? Thank you, That's the question you answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Vijay from United States. See, the first thing is now I would like to suggest the youth uh, leader. Please read the book by the former founding prime minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, yes. from the third world to first world. Mm -hmm. Then you will understand what kind of leadership we lack, in not only in Namibia, in entire third world countries and Africa. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the second thing is now, okay, like, uh, generally when you speak about these issues of like, uh, people don't know this, people don't know this, they are not aware, we have to. See, the point is here, the government must make them. Because this country, when it was taken over, the people are not, everybody was sent to education, all of them are engineers and doctors and professionals. No, the country was taken over in a very bad shape. The, the public, the majority of the public in bad shape. It was not taken over like with a highly educated population here and then it's growing now. No, nothing of that sort. So that means whoever took over the government should have got the responsibility to make these people ready to face the, the world, whatever they are going to face. That has not been done. The government is lacking. That is for sure. The first point is the leadership, any leadership, anyway, they don't have this, I'm sorry to say that, I find it in most of the third world countries, these leaders, they don't like their people, most probably I think so. Yeah. They don't seem to love their people. They sell their country for anything. Okay, you guys are, sorry to say that, you guys all remember there's a Gupta in South Africa. That Chava, you remember. So somebody from India, a company, he starts here and buy the entire government out and tell him who should be the finance minister, who should be the economics minister. That's a shame. That's the kind of leadership you are sitting with. It's very easy to buy an African leader. Okay, simple solutions. We need people with integrity. Okay, now you throw people out if they don't show what you want them to show and what they promise to show. Otherwise, you throw them out. You have the world in pictures. Play on that. Thank, thank, thank you very much, much, sir. Thank you very much. Suggestion. I don't want to repeat whatever has been said. So I would like to suggest a, a solution that um, all of us here, we are privileged 
and we should use ourselves to educate others, to share information, translate the policies and procedures and whatever frameworks are developed by government to go back to our communities and educate the nation. So in that way, information will reach everyone. So we should be the change agent because we have the platforms, we are able to do it so we can start as us as of now rather than we say government and this and this. So let's start we use ourselves as agents of change. Thank you. Thank you so much. And all protocol themselves. Um, I go by the name of Matthew Bigaima. Um, uh, I have a, a short question. Um, it's not really a question, but um, uh, as, as a young person, um, I have been I have been moving away from the expert of holding the government expert, um, holding the government accountable. But then today you said we should be brutal and truthful. The government, we, um, we appreciate what it has done the 33 years, but we, we should see the government has failed us. Because we want the government to acknowledge that it has failed us. Because they are refusing to acknowledge that they have failed us. Because with the amount of minerals that we have, and the population that we have in this country, there is no way that we should have such an unequal wealth, wealth distribution. It's really, it's unreasonable to, to say the truth. So um, I just want to, like, can the government take the accountability that it has failed? Can the government just come forth and say that it has failed in this? And then the other thing is this, um, uh, a, 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 good, a good politician was saying that the, uh, um, the young people can't lead. Then coming from a good politician that we respect, that saying a young person can't be in, in, in leadership, what does that say? So the government is the, the government does not have the interest of the youth at heart at all. Thank you. Thank exactly. You very Thank you very much. I feel like it's about high time the universities sits with the ministries of, of higher education plus the industry and think about policies. For example, we in 2019 we had an intake of of students who are doing education. 43 percent of them. Out of 60, over 60,000 intakes in the all universities, 40, 43 were teachers. But that's why you see a high unemployment rate among teachers. You see a, even the soldier right now, you see him starting teaching and then still he's unemployed because he thought maybe by teaching he might improve his lifestyle. So maybe you should, you should start there from the universities, just try and engage with the ministries. I know they are difficult to go to, but try and push them and try and push other lectures to see that with the ministers. My critique, so I have to bring this up. I feel like the, the chairperson of NYC is staying in another country. Yeah. Because as a young person in Akubia, all your statements are not really think they are truthful. Why am I saying so? You say something that there's no political chaos. Namibian society is very peaceful. That's why in demonstration you won't see Namibians burning tires like what South Africans are doing. Mm -hmm. But what we saw on Independence Day, young people went on the streets Independence Day to demonstrate about unemployment. And then you say there is no political chaos. So I don't know what is there. The other thing when you talked about the targeted youth review, that is part of the social contract we are talking about. You are leading people, so you have to, to raise a report to say, so far this is how we have came. So far this is how short we are to, to the promises that we have given them. So let me just pack them up because I'm not disillusioned around the challenges. No, am I. Um, in an ivory tower that disconnects me from my constituency, that are my peers, the young people. The challenges are there. Youth unemployment is in our homes. It affects our brothers, our sisters, our nieces, and our cousins. But our approach and our response to unemployment, in particular youth unemployment, should not only be, what is government doing? And I speak for myself, and I use myself as an example to, to, my, to my senior at the back. Because I come from a house that was born without privilege. I come from a marginalized background. As a young female leader that is of color, um, I had to make certain decisions to ensure that my narrative will not be that poverty will dictate uh, my potential or poverty will limit where I'll be one day. 
That means that if Sharonese, who was not born in not born with privilege, not born with a silver spoon in her mouth, has reached a, a certain level of success, surely it means that many young people with similar circumstances that are disenfranchised can also reach it. So youth unemployment, as we have it, colleagues, requires us to have a multi-sectoral approach, which means when government is tasked with setting the policy environment, we have private sector, government on top of it, and I'm not saying that government has done well. Government also has the duty to ensure that it creates sectors that allows for employment creation. But there is a responsibility that we have as private sector. There is a responsibility that we have as young people. And I'll give you an example. Just recently, I've embarked on regional visits to visit the young people within the structures of the National Youth Council. The National Youth Council has structures such as our constituency youth forums, there are youth-led structures, um, as well as regional youth forums. And the visit was um, threefold. One, to inform them of the new strategic intent of the council, to discuss um, policy issues relative to our act that we are busy uh, or that we are busy in the process of reviewing, but also to hear from the young people what their challenges are. And at the very top of these challenges were youth unemployment. But conversing with young people, I also got the feedback from young people that we are limited in our thinking. And I'll give practical examples to, to justify why I say so. We have young people living in regions that have economic strengths. Um, uh, with the resources that they are exposed to, for instance, young people at the coast, young people in the Kavango, East Kavango, West and Zambezi regions that have access to rivers, that have access to fertile soil. So when we are speaking of youth unemployment, you are a graduate with a necessary understanding expertise that you have gained from a university. What limits you from starting a cooperative to say, we want to set up a green scheme in a region where we have fertile soil, where we have access to water, where we need the necessary support to ensure that this green scheme takes off. And while you may not agree with what I'm saying, these are the interventions that, that we need to start conversing about as young people. Because to sit and only have a mentality that jobs must be created for us, that I must be a job seeker and not a job creator, is not going to work entirely. The National Youth Council is an entity created by government to facilitate that kind of support to young people. To stand here today and accept that the National Youth Council is, is not entirely meeting its mandate, I also can't accept. Because the National Youth Council, for instance, run programs such as a credit for youth in business scheme, where we support village young entrepreneurs that do not have access to the kind of financing that they would qualify for through institutions such as Agribank and DBM. The National Youth Council has programs such as the Youth Leadership Development Programs, where we are developing a crop of young leaders to have the necessary soft skills to become lead young leaders that can help the country attain its vision and its goals. The National Youth Council has a program that is an equipment and grant program where we support young existing entrepreneurs to expand on their business initiatives at a grassroots level. So to stand here tonight and just to say, young people must accept and be conditioned that our mentality must just be leaned towards what can my government do for me? We will not go very far. And I think when we start reasoning to say, with the environment in which we are finding ourselves as young people, how can we challenge ourselves to think differently, to become productive agents? And I really want to challenge you to say that we need to think differently as young people. If we continue with a mentality that I must only accept handouts, how competitive are you going to become? As a young Namibian, you need to argue not only as a Namibian, as an African. You need to argue as a global citizen. But if you are conditioned only to hand me downs and hand outs, how are you going to influence a youth agenda at a continental level and on the global scene? But Namibia is not an Namibia is not an island. We exist within the, the, the African context. We exist within the global village. But to continue uh, uh, this the, this perpetuation around a narrative that government alone, government alone, is one that we can't accept. Private thank sector. Very, very uh, just, just thank you, thank you very much. You see, let me tell you. Let's identify the elephant in the room. <laughs> the elephant in the room. And the, the lecture from Yuna, I think he identified the, the elephant in the room. It's a leadership. I've been around. I think you can see I'm white. Yeah, so 
there was a question that how do we know that the policies are okay? Huh? That are good. We benchmark. I traveled with, uh, uh, you know, South Korea have developed. With, I traveled with the highly, you know, uh, highly ranking uh, 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 senior officials to, to South Korea. The team was headed by Professor Kajabi with uh, Tom Armando, the Johnny State last this year, and so on. We went there to Korea Development Institute to learn about uh, leadership and the development, how Korea develops. So these are countries that we have, we have benchmarked. When I went to uh, ILO with different ministers, we consulted other ministers, other governments. So even the, the, the policies, we benchmark. We developed the, 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 the policy. And I'll give credit here also that we developed these policies consulting the stakeholders here. The youth were consulted. They were part of that. And also with the help of the experts like Kavi Ruhas, the Herbert is there, we put heads together. It's actually we benchmarked, it's a good policy. The only problem, and we subjected it to to independent evaluation. It was actually evaluated by independent group from UK, from uh, from Switzerland, and so on. It's good, but it was found that one, there's no leadership in terms of coordination. Two, there was no resources. Do you know that even Vision 2030 was not budgeted? For? No money, but the vision is there. <laughs> Go and ask it. National Development Plan is there. No money. <laughs> you understand? That is the seriousness. Labor for survey, the last statistics you have here is 2018. You know why? If you produce statistics it's to reveal, we have to admit this government that we have said. You are right. We have to admit. Yes, we have to admit. But if we don't admit, what do you do? You. <laughs> That's a question for you. Let me say, yeah, yeah, I think we will go. But I want to leave you with the question. Huh? I want to, to leave you with the question. Go and do a sign. Africa hates dictators. Asia hates dictators. But Asia developed. Africa did not develop. For me, did not develop. Go and do that assignment as students. You will find out why. You will find out why. Huh? Thank, thank you. Very very elephant in the room. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, everyone, and thank you for the critique, um, especially about the statistics. Um, I probably have to say that the lack of statistics is not the same as it's untrue. And I think. Um, that's what we have to evaluate, whether the statement is true. Yes. If you have to assess it, even if there are no statistics, and there are many things that you do not need statistics to for to actually verify that there is a problem in society. Um, and that is also not to say that we do not need statistics, because we do need it to be able to make informed policies and informed uh, decisions. Um, I come up from the humanities and we do a lot of desktop research as people in the humanities are doing philosophy and all of that. So you should excuse me when I do not use a lot of statistics in my presentations because that's not just... Uh, philosophers in general give a very critical approach towards statistics. There is lies and there is statistics, that's how we all can improve <laughs> All right, um, but then also, I think, uh, and I do appreciate uh, Ms. Bush, uh, uh, and especially when you stand, uh, you know that there are probably activities that you're also carrying out, and they're not being recognized, and I think we need to acknowledge that there is something happening behind uh, 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 the, the, the curtain. Uh, stuff that we do not see, it's not everything that is uh, visible to our eyes, and that we need to appreciate. But there are people who are making huge strides and efforts to actually do something about it. 
Uh, however, as far as our government uh, institutions are concerned, I would probably like to quote uh, Boa Ventura again, and he says, where the political system itself is all just or self-justifying and failing to recognize its imperfections as complete and see itself as a complete uh, entity, the result is the abrogation of responsibility for the social problems. And I think that's what we need to realize. It's being able to see that there is a problem in this structure. And when I say leadership, I'm not saying that there is absence of leadership. <coughs> leadership, I'm using it in a very particular sense. Being able to cast a vision and take the entire nation along with you to be able to fulfill that. And nobody, and everybody, as they are going along, their lives are being bettered. And not simply because they have proximity to power or some sort of affiliation in order for their lives to become better in that cast vision. And that is what leadership look, should look like. And we should not mistake to think that being in a political position makes you a leader. Yes. Yeah. Those are two. Just briefly, Dr. Yeah, all right. Oh, well, and then coming back to the good life. The good life I use it in a very philosophical sense. The good life is not that you should be able to live in China and they have a flat on your own and a sport car. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, what does it take? What are the tangible measures by which we say that once an individual in society has these tangible measures, they are actually living the good life? Mm -hmm. And are those tangible measures um, um, are we possible to replicate them, that everybody is able to access them? If we do not do that, then we are not living a good life. It's not a, a just society, it's not a good society in which we find ourselves. Thank you. I'm Kambo. Um, I'm from the Ministry of Labour, but I'm just here for myself, not for the Ministry. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes um, I think there was a question about... Um, what is the what should we do or what are the root cause of unemployment? Um, yes, from my perspective, I think it's the uh, how we bring the social contract. Uh, I think it comes from the resources that we have in the country. I think we need to make a shift. Uh, you know, we been we get companies to extract resources and create employment in the other world. So we need to create employment here. That is what we need to do. We need to add values to the products here, not out there. And then we buy added values from the resources that we got from here. So I think that is the shift that we need to take and we need leaders that have integrity Mm -hmm. to do this. I don't know any leader in Namibia yet because uh, people have got this perception. There's a couple of young leaders that are out there that you could say, okay, this person maybe could do this. And But we have um, the perception in the, in, in, the, in the environment that when we see a young leader uh, uh, that we think is promising, then there's a perception that the person, the Europeans are behind them. And then mistrust comes again. So those are the issues, I, I think. Uh, thank, you. thank you. I just have a one request to all the panelists. When will we stop existing and start living in the same Namibia? Regardless of our political differences, because I'm like, we have been pointing fingers too much. We have been fighting too much. Such a small population with so many differences. My question to my beloved panelists is, when are we starting to live in the same Namibia, like if the boat sink, is either we all go or we all survive. Thank you. To start off with is um, to our representative, our youth leader. I don't want to say what have already been said by the others, uh, but I think after you leave from here, I'm sure that you every time you have come to the podium, every time you were speaking, there was a serious disconnection between yourself and the audience. Just take that as your answer, that what you were saying, you have left with a lot of us with a very hard pill for us to swallow. 
Then the question I wanted to ask you to the panelist is, um, we have got a Ministry of Labor and Employment Creation. Maybe my learned uh, panelist there, how do this ministry create job? <laughs> so far, how had it been successfully creating job? If it is not creating job, then it needs to be renamed. Let us remove the job employment creation. Then, to the youth leader again, I just wanted to leave with you something that um, in Zambia just uh, around two years, close to two years ago now, going almost two years, HH became the president of Zambia. On his 100 days in office, there were more than 100,000 jobs created in Zambia. 100 days and more than uh, 100,000 youth were uh, got job in Zambia. If we are denying that there is no leadership crisis in Namibia, can we also be able to say the same, even if I have to use the, the last term of our current president, have he have also successfully brought 100 youth also in government? It's government which employed those people in Zambia because some of them are teachers and nurses. And then the my yes, yes, the last one. Um, what is the problem which we had been having so far for the past years is that we have gotten the Ministry of Defense receiving a very huge budget each and every year when we don't have war in Namibia. So that is one of our problems. And then to the solutions, yes, the solution now is that we have got Nakaradam, we have got green schemes in the north. This one, if our government can prioritize to agriculture, and then I believe that Namibia can become the food basket in Sadek, even just before Corona, even the eggs used to come from Sweden. But if we can be able to start investing in green scheme and then lastly is that we have got to remember yes we have got uh, dbn dbn as an example my brother there is an engineer when he's going to graduate and he go to dbn to apply for a loan they are going to ask him that yes we want you to give a 20 uh, million collateral before we give you a loan where will he get it Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tapera Nakashona. I am a student ambassador from the Namibia University of Science and Technology and a mobilizer of NANSO, but I'm standing here in personal capacity. So before I address my two points, number one, I just want to make it clear that I'm not attacking anybody. So personally, as a young Namibian youth leader and activist, I believe that the youth is not progressing and the youth is not getting employment because our leaders inhabit positions because of what they did, not because they are qualified for the positions. <laughs> Namely, number one, our current Minister of Agriculture, Slalis Ledvine, Lord bless his work and what he's done for the Namibian community, but look at what happened under his leadership in the Ministry of Finance. If you look at his qualification, maybe Google lied to me, I don't know, but Shala only has um, qualifications in zoology, and different other sectors that are compliant to agriculture. What made him suitable for a finance office? And let's look at everything that has happened under the government in terms of financial corruption, financial corruption and the economic scandals that happened when Charles Ledvine was actually in finance office. Second thing I am opposing, and the second question that I want to ask is, what has the government done? I believe that as a youth person, I will not have a problem with the government personnel is giving tenders to each other. I would have a problem, and the problem we inhabit now in the community is that the government is giving tenders to people that are, number one, selfish and egocentric. Let's say, for example, the tender of the condoms of 600 and something million that was given to an individual. I believe that we as the youth would not have a problem if the owner of that tender would have gone to the Caprivi region, would have gone to the Kavango region, to the Oshiwango, to the Karas, and employed at least 200 Namibian citizens to work under that tender. We would not have an issue. So I, my question is, when is the labor and when is the government going to impose laws or acts that allows 
better manifestos and proposals to these tenders that benefit the youth employment. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank you, uh, my name is Jose Claro, um, and um, I'm thinking that the, the problem that we are having, and, and I, I have been engaging a lot of national project, uh, projects. Uh, I, I have been, and for, for starters, I have been with Herbert was my first um, teacher in to South Africa when I was graduating. So I came up quite a long way within the training and fraternity. And I'm also engaging a lot of uh, international projects. And, and the only problem that I'm seeing is that why we are failing as Namibians is that the fact that we don't coordinate our projects. This ministry is doing this, the other ministry is doing this, and then at the end of the day, the coordination and the stimulation of that coordination is nowhere to be found. And we should be honest sometimes. It is about greed. Some of the people just want to see what is in for me in any project. And that is the problem of corruption. If you look at the amount that is corruptly being transformed within individuals, it's even more than to support any project that Jews can also do. Because it's millions. You will never find a corrupt deal that goes out, it's in 100,000 100, or 200 dollars corrupt. It's millions. And the problem that we need to deal with now is to see, and I in fact we say, the, the government has accepted that they have failed. I have received a letter also that says that the government is now seeking from ILO to see how they can deal with the inequalities within Namibia. And I think they have acknowledged to say that we have failed. Now, when that failure is coming, as you, what do we do? We need to also take government accountable. Sometimes we are just sitting here, we are just complaining, but we don't also stand up and show the government that we are not happy. Thank you very much. When others are demonstrating, others are saying that, no, it's not my, my cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. And I think, moderator, next time make enough time for all of us, because there's a lot of questions that we need to ask. No, 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 no. Uh, let me say, because the topic is about the social protections, um, how to address this is uh, we have to be discourage private health centers and private educational institutions. And then we equip the public institutions. If we, in, if we do not equip our public institutions, we are still encouraging inequality. Then we have to address that one. And the second one, and the second is, if we look at, when we talk of social protection, we also have to look at our communities. Now, in the communities, how is our housing? Many people are living in romantic uh, dwellings, while others are living in a very comfortable houses. We have to address that one. We have to address the housing. We have to create type of housing which we need in the past, before people even in cleaner were getting houses, even people were working in, 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 the, in the in the shop, they were getting houses. Why is today impossible? Look at other countries, even in the southern region, even says say sales and okay, although the economy is less, but they are. And the other thing which we have, which we have all the address, I think uh, the issue of uh, corporate, as mentioned by the youth leader. I think I do not agree with you that people, for example, in the Bangkok, they can create a corporate to start with what? To start with, with stone or what? <laughs> Thank you very much. Youth unemployment rate, right? and when you look at the people who got the chances to speak, probably 70% of them were not even youth. So it all starts from the grassroots. Um, by the way, I wanted to find out from this Bosch. Um, talking about the basic income crisis. What, do you, what is your take on it? And I want you to press on it. What is your take on it? Thank you very much. I want you to emphasize on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I came here for one reason. I wanted to hear the experts. When I say experts, many of you have a point of view. Right? I want you to say how employment should be created. I'm not talking about should we change the leadership? Should we do that? That's fine. We've given you've given your criticisms of what you don't like. Um, Kabinda said something. Sharonis said something. Uh, professor, doctor, and uh, Albius, and uh, the colleague from the Economic Trust. 
I would like you to tell us, just simple, I want to walk away from here knowing, because other countries have created employment, okay? Now, I personally believe employment can be created on a large scale, and I'm sure you've been thinking about this, so please, could I have, or could we have the benefit of your thinking about this? Yes. So firstly, I would like to start off with um, how do you expect the youth to create employment for themselves when they are not educated, when they are not taught? Look at the room. We are the youth that are here, right? Um, you can see a few of us that are here that get empowerment and stuff like that. Go to Havana region. How many youth, full people, they can come up with employment opportunities for themselves? How many? Think of them. And an example is with a basic income grant, it it plays as a as a what is it, it plays as a tool or something that you can get to in, to in, <laughs> okay, so what I'm saying is, in terms of the basic income that when you look at it, that acts as a, as a tool or a starting point for youth for them to come up with their own initiatives. But when you look at things like the betting, it's being regulated for some reason, but that's where most of the young people get their income from. And that's where someone can come with an idea and initiative. They can go to government and say, no, I came up with this company, but now it's being regulated. Why are they regulating the betting? Another thing is, Mr. Dr. Casero mentioned in his presentation that um, when you go, when the engineer that is graduating next year, when he goes to the bank, he's being told we want twenty million collateral. Where do you expect to get that from? Where you come from a disadvantaged background? The system that is in place there is already discriminatory. That's one thing I would say for sure. And another thing is it's not inclusive because as a young person, where do you expect me to find twenty million Namibian dollars from this collateral? And then another thing I want to say is many of us are speaking from positions of privilege. We are not being considerate about what's happening really on him. I think most of us that are sitting here don't really go in and engage with the youth and see what is really happening. Maybe you only stop here in Soweto, maybe you don't go to Koreaham, maybe you don't go to Ubuntu, maybe you don't you do not engage these people, that's why you don't know what is happening on him, and you are speaking from a position of privilege, so you don't really speak from what is really going on. And then with with the resources, the president has made it clear that the oil is not ours. <laughs> Okay, so um in response to this and in response to this I would say that personally for me there isn't anything right now that can create employment apart from the agricultural sector. If the government was to invest in the agricultural sector and to also empower the people, because in as much as you invest in something and the youth is not empowered about it, then we are not going to enter those spaces and make a difference. But if you empower me and invest in whatever thing that you want me to in in whatever thing you want me to get in, then obviously I will be able to win the agricultural sector and set up a a substantial farm, or what is it called? Oh, yeah, those farms that contribute to the well-being of the country. Because when you look at um, the contributing factors, or the, the, con the one of the factors that contribute to the country's budget, this includes VAT and also direct taxes. So meaning that the people are actually meeting government halfway, it's government that is not, not meeting us halfway, because we are doing our part, even as civil society. Another thing is also to introduce the universal basic income grant, and I'm happy that the Minister of Poverty, Honorable Doreen Sloka, has mentioned it a few days back on the Namibian Broadcasting News Corporation, where she mentioned that the universal basic income grant is being created. So if we implement a universal basic income grant, that would be a starting point. Because now, you are teaching people how to fish and you are giving them the tool for them to fish. Because now what is happening is, you are teaching people how to fish, but you are not providing them with the resources that are needed to be fishing. Thank, thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, 
You see, the Minister of Labor, the Minister of Labor cannot create employment alone. The name, don't worry about the name. <laughs> it cannot create employment alone. It's a whole government approach and also the private sector together. So, and we, we develop policies. In those policies, you have programs and projects. And then you implement the, the policies together, private sector and, and government. So, in fact, the Ministry of Labor coordinates the activities for employment creation. So, I, I just wanted to, to say that. Uh, in terms of, uh, 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 there was a question, I think, I don't know whether I missed another question. Uh, uh, before I come to I mean, for the sake of time, we can just go to your contribution. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to say also with uh, what your uh, advocate are going to ask me that how can we create employment? I think we should do change the way we have been doing things, advocate. From 1997, I think we are doing the same thing. So if you expect to get a different result doing the same thing, I think that is uh, it's, it's not it's not good at all. But then I, I feel that uh, we developed the uh, employment directives in the ministry in terms of linking to procurement. Government can create employment through procurement. That is the development budget. So we have directives that can uh, that says those who support uh, enterprises of young people, they should get tenders, and also those who employ more people and so on. Those directives, if we can implement them appropriately, I think we can create employment. Public revenue driven from capital intensive sectors, if we can really channel those revenues to labor intensive sectors, public wage programs. I think I forget you agree with me. Expanded in South Africa, this expanded public waste program. It has created massive employment. If we do that, the other one is that multinational companies operating in Namibia should be required to support the local, the local uh, industries uh, within the where they operate. A, a town like Usakose, Karibibu, and so on. Those towns could have been developed because of the mines, the, the mines that are operating there. And they support local uh, uh, enterprises there to create sustainable jobs. I think those are the things that we can do. And also, there's a program, the UN program. I think Advocate is aware of that. Global Accelerator. It's a United Secretary, UN Secretary General program. Global Accelerator, it says, they want to help countries to accelerate. Then the two things very that I will mention to accelerate employment creation and social protection, which is equally key to advocate here. And that will be a game changer. I want to say this, I want to applaud that government has made effort in that because this program was only for less developed countries. Uh, but you know, Namibia is about you. We are rich. But we love it. I think I will give credit to a team also led by Advocate Yafwin. We love it, and our president went and they agreed that Namibia, we know your status, but you will be part of this. And I agree, Advocate. If we, we meet the, the conditions and then we, we, we implement that program. It will be a game changer because the UN will support the employment creation initiative in this country to pass trade. So we will create more. I think there are a lot of uh, uh, we will share advocate some other recommendations. But I think if we do that, we will definitely uh, 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 create employment. Thank you. But remember, I asked the question. I'm from. I don't know whether when we we finish when we meet. Maybe I will get the answer. I said we have to identify the owner of a club and then the coach. Immediate thing, immediate thing, we will fire the coach. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I did identify the coach. Yeah. yeah. But I will not mention the name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much for an evening like this. And I know that there are uh, 
the, all of us have an interest in this country that is ours, and we all want to find solutions. And that's why we have these differences of opinions and views of how solutions should be found. It's not because the other person's view is wrong. It's because they see the world different from you. But probably also looking at the same thing from because of our different experiences. And therefore, I think, especially when we deal with issues such as youth unemployment, this is not statistics that we are dealing with. We're dealing with real human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my students, when I asked him to tell me a little bit about his unemployment uh, experience, um, he says, eventually he got a job, but now he's studying to, to, to actually get a degree in psychology. And he says, when I was unemployed, immediately after school for about seven years, it's not because I was just not working, even my brain was not working. That's how I felt less human. I didn't know what to do with my own life. So these are the realities that we are talking about when we are speaking about youth unemployment. People who have lost hope. Sometimes, some also that there may be opportunities available, but they do not know how to access them. And this is why we say, how do we coordinate the resources that we have to bring them to the people that need them, to be able to access Life, life enhancing opportunity. So therefore, let's not make judgment on others based on where we come from, uh, based on what we have achieved, the opportunities we were able to access, and think that because I was able to access certain opportunities, you too can do it. No, you can't. Uh, it's, that's what's really different about us as human beings. My opportunities do not necessarily translate that my children will have similar opportunity, or my cousin, or my friend, or my neighbor also. Um, Ms. Yatoipo asked a very interesting question. I think Ms. Tomia has already answered part of that. But I also think that when we think about the tender system in the media, uh, what, what enhanced the apartheid system is that the apartheid system gave tenders to briefcase companies. And that's how individuals became very wealthy overnight uh, under the apartheid system. Tender system didn't come start with us after independence. It has been there. And we have continued with that kind of a structure without actually saying real established industries must actually apply for tenders so that they can be able to absorb those that are unemployed. And I think this is what tenders should be. Because it's billions of dollars that we're investing in this without seeing any results. That if some, if she has an established company, that when she gets that tender, we say, okay, based on this amount that we're giving you, we should be able to create jobs for this number of people, at least for the next number of years. Not for three months, not for five months, but actually sustainable employment must be created through established structures of industries that are already in place. So that people can actually see that money is being channeled and it's being uh, effectively used in established institutions. Rather than now we have a tender of 1.3 billion given to a five-year-old. And you're wondering, where is this company? How many people is it going to employ? These are the realities that the kinds of structures that we have are not helping in undoing the social realities that many young people are experiencing. What we are doing with carelessly uh, uh, giving out tenders is that we are enhancing greedy individuals to exacerbate, uh, to exacerbate the, the, the pain of our young people by feathering, actually, unemployment and inequality too. So I do thank you for attending here tonight. Thank you for the criticism. Thank you for the dialogues and may these conversations go on. Perhaps in, in conclusion, I want to thank um, everyone for your comments, for your opinions, for your views. I do believe that when we have platforms such as these, we shouldn't allow it to degenerate because there is no right or wrong answer. It is a perspective that you share um, from the position that you are in. Um, and whether you agree with what I say or not, it allows me also to listen to you, for you to listen to me, and for us to have a conversation on how to improve what we have. So I really want to thank everyone for your comments, 
whether it was harsh, whether it was um, unpleasant, <laughs> whether it was hostile. Thank you for the engagement here tonight. I also want to thank um, our uh, presenter uh, that delivered the, the, the public lecture, Dr. Vassila, uh, for a very well researched uh, document that allowed us to have this robust conversation and to my fellow discussants. I do believe that in conclusion, there's one thing that we need to agree that urgent reform is needed and that urgent scaling up is needed. Um, as the executive chair of the National Youth Council, we, I, I personally can't shy away from the challenges that we are confronted with because these challenges are faced by young people, young people that are my friends, young people that are my immediate um, constituents and my immediate interfaces. I do, however, believe that Namibia is all we have, and to build Namibia requires a collective and shared responsibility. And to answer Madame Yatoibo's question on how do we create employment is something that I believe that government alone cannot be held accountable for. I think I've indicated that there's an urgent need to ensure that we strengthen sectors that create employment. And these sectors are sectors that are labor intensive. And that labor intensive sectors are sectors such as our fisheries, our trade sector, the, our, agricultural, our, our agricultural sector, mines and energy, Ministry of Works, these are sectors where that is labor intensive, that requires us to do the job. For us to do the job means that we also need to put a spotlight on Tibet. As young people, when we, when we get out of high school, most of us strive to be doctors, lawyers, and accountants. So when we are speaking on the, the, on the question of how do we address youth unemployment, as young people, we must also be willing to say, I have no shame in becoming an artisan, because an artisan requires me to participate in the economic space by doing the job, by employing, um, by, create, by becoming an employment creator. So TMA, the TMA educational system is a space that we must strengthen, that we must not stigmatize as a less uh, uh, less uh, for more for the less uneducated space where young people need to go to for our for our economy to to really have structural reform and systemic change it must be driven by Tibet um, Tibet uh, an influx of Tibet into that space because for as long as our economic space is labor intensive we will be able to absorb late um, humans to do the job. So in conclusion, I really just want to say that, yes, we have the divergent views on the subject, but I want to conclude to say that to ensure youth unemployment is arrested and that an immediate debt is made requires the involvement of private sector, requires the involvement of government, but it also requires the involvement of a strong civil society. Most of what we have heard tonight is about holding our leaders accountable. And we can only hold our leaders accountable when we also have a strong civil society. And I do believe that Namibia is led by leaders that, that puts their people first. We can see this also through the investment that government makes in its social safety nets. Out of Namibia's national budget, we spend about um, I do not want to get my figures wrong, um, 6.5 billion of our national budget on social safety nets. That also speaks to the priorities of the Namibian government. But in concluding, I want to say that Namibia is all we have colleagues and it requires all of us to participate in nation building. And your, your divergent views and opposing views to me indicates that you have hope. Hope that we can change the current system quo if we all work together. Thank you very much.